Were you blessed with that music? As I was listening, I was just transported to heaven. And um, it's amazing what music can do. You know, and music is, uh, can just distract you from all the things of this life, the cares, the, the things of this world, and transcend our thoughts heavenward. And I can't wait till we get to heaven someday. Um, today's message is entitled, Facing Your Life's Record. Facing Your Life's Record. And as Elder Brian mentioned, the other Brian, he, it is the topic dealing with judgment. And I'm trying to look for clicker. This is what happens when you have too many things to carry. You start to lose track of where you put things. All right. Well, I'm going to ask that uh, you do two things today as we get into today's message. I know that uh, in Isaiah chapter 28, 9 and 10, it tells us that um, to whom shall he teach knowledge? And to whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Those that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept should be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. So in other words, my friends, I know that some of us want a type of sermon that is, Jesus loves me, this I know. <laughs> for the Bible tells me so. right? And that's good, but based on the text that I just recited, Isaiah 28, 9 and 10, it says that, whom will he teach knowledge? And whom will he make to know and understand doctrine? Thank you. Those that are weaned from the milk. Now, milk is good for a baby. Okay? But when you get older, you've got to be able to digest meat, real meat. Okay? So I'm going to really ask those of you that may find today's message a little hard, I'm going to ask that you ask the Holy Spirit to help you to take in that meat. Okay? And on the other side, for those of you that know the Bible, you know the 28 fundamental beliefs like the back of your hand, and you know the Bible, you can memorize those things, I want you to also pray as you listen to this message that you say, Lord, help me not to just understand the theory of truth, but let me be changed by it. May you soften my heart and make me sensitive to be more like Christ. Okay, so I want whatever group you're in, I want you to pray. I want you to pray for me as well as I'm preaching today because I really need your prayers, first of all. And secondly, I want you to pray as I'm preaching. I want you to pray quietly to yourself. Say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth because I want to be truthful to convey what God has to say about this topic. And I know this topic can be a very disturbing topic for some people, but I, I hope that we can... Um, instill some, some hope, despite the fact that we are going into this topic. It's a heavy topic, so I'm going to ask that before we start, let's have a word of prayer, and let's ask the Spirit to be with us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the Sabbath day, and Lord, we come before you ready to feed on your word. Lord, we ask for the Holy Spirit to soften our hearts and our, and our minds so that we can hear your voice speaking directly to each and every one of us and to know where we stand um, in our relationship with you today and how we can uh, better that relationship as a result of today's message. So Lord, please send the Spirit, speak through me and breathe through me, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Daniel chapter 7. You're probably there already from the scripture reading. But uh, Daniel chapter 7, while you're looking up Daniel chapter 7, who knows what Daniel chapter 7 is about? Anybody? Four beasts, okay. Anything else? Judgment, okay. Um, yeah, most likely when you, say, when you ask people what Daniel chapter 7 is about, they'll most likely say the four beasts 
that come out of the sea, right? Um, but if you actually read the whole chapter, um, the four beasts, yes, they're on the beginning of chapter 7, but they are not the main focus, okay? Just a quick little outline of Daniel chapter 7. You'll see the first part of Daniel chapter 7 talks about the, seven, the four beasts, and then it goes into a little horn, and it talks about this little horn's doing, and then this little horn turns out to be blaspheming God, and then whenever the little horn's mentioned, he's doing something either against God or against God's people. Okay? And after the little horn's mentioned, it's very interesting, the pattern goes to, it, it, we go into a judgment scene. Okay? And all throughout chapter 7, you see this pattern. Every time the little horn's mentioned, doing something, right next, after that, judgment scene. You see that all throughout chapter 7. And in chap Daniel chapter 7, um, we're going to look at verse 9 and 10, which Elder Samuel read. But let's, let's read that again together. This is a judgment scene found in Daniel chapter 10, verse 9. I mean, Dan Daniel chapter 7, I'm sorry. Verse 9 and 10. Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. And it reads... I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and his hair of his head was like the pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from him. Thousands, thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. So here's a judgment scene found in Daniel chapter 7. I remember an incident during my seminary years back in Andrews. I was sitting in a class, sanctuary class, with uh, Dr. Richard Davidson. You guys probably know him. He spoke for last year's Barn Conference. And we were sitting on, in this class. I was sitting in this class. And I happened to slip into a seat. I, I kind of slipped in a little late, and there was no seat. So I just tried to find a seat up in the front. And there's one vacancy. I slipped into that seat. And as I slipped in, the topic discussed was the judgment. And right sitting next to me was another lady who was also taking the class. And as the professor was talking about the judgment, she leans over to me and she says, don't you think this is scary? <laughs> and I, I looked at her and I said, is it scary to you? She said, yeah, it is. Like, how do I know I'm going to be prepared? How do I know I'm going to be saved? And she was really serious about this. And I was like, wow, what can you say to that? You know, you can't just give like a quick answer to a question like that. And obviously she, was, she seemed very disturbed by the idea of the judgment. And so, you know, the Holy Spirit worked and so we arranged to have Bible studies, me and that lady and her friend. And um, although she was in the seminary, she was a seminary student, we had a Bible study on the sanctuary. And um, praise God, it was a blessing for her. It just opened her mind to the idea of what the whole idea of the judgment is. And the judgment, believe it or not, is connected very closely to the sanctuary message. And we're going to discuss that today. But <laughs> I'm just going to say this. The topic of the judgment is never a popular topic. Have you noticed that? It's not a popular topic. I, in fact, I believe many people don't want to preach on the judgment because it doesn't leave a, a warm, fuzzy feeling inside after you hear it. And, you know, one thing that we need to consider is that if what the Bible says is true, that all will stand in the judgment someday. The worst thing we can do is turn a blind eye and say, okay, I'm just going to pretend it's not going to come. That's the worst thing we can do, right? Because if it's true, we need to know how to prepare. We need to do, know what to do to face the judgment with confidence. Amen? And so today, 
um, let's study about the judgment. All right. In Daniel's vision, we see what we just read. Daniel sees the characters and lives of men that should pass in review in the judgment. And according to this, these texts, the judgment is set. In other words, this judgment is now in session. And it says that the books are open. The books are open. So what are these books? Well, Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. Let's take a look there. Revelation chapter 20, verse 12 has a very similar picture of the judgment as Daniel 7, 9 and 10. But Revelation 20, verse 12 gives us a little bit more information. So let's take a look there. Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. Keep your thumb in Daniel 7, if it's not too late. <laughs> and uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 20. Let's see what we see here in, in verse 12. I'm sorry, Revelation 20, verse 12. Did I say 12, 20? Yeah. I'm getting it all mixed up. Pray for me, okay? Pray for me. Revelation 12, verse 20. Okay. Yeah, 20. Ugh. Revelation 20, verse 12. 20, verse 12. Okay. And it says, And I saw the dead, small and great, Stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So question, what determines the judgment of the dead? Their works, right? So they were judged according to their works, right? It's very clear there. So in other words, the books of records that this text is telling us about is that these books contain the record of every single deed of every single person that ever existed. Now, pause and think about it. I shudder to think how many deeds do I have recorded by a recording angel of all the wrong that I've done. It'll probably reach past the ceiling or even more, right? But the Bible makes it very clear. Let's take a look at what these books are, okay? First we see mention of what? The book of life, right? The book of life. And uh, Jesus says, you don't have to look there, but Luke chapter 10, verse 12, Je Luke chapter 10, verse 20, Jesus says, rejoice because your names are written in heaven, right? So the good news is, if you have your name written in the book of life, that's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a very good thing, okay? So if your name is found written in the book of life, that's good. But also, however, according to Revelation 3, verse 5, Jesus also says, and he implies in Revelation 3, verse 5, that our names can be blotted out of the book of life. Okay? To him that doesn't overcome, I will, not, I will blot his name out of the book of life. Revelation 3, verse 5. Okay, so it's good to have your name in the book of life, but it can also be blotted out. Okay? So... That's what we can learn about the book of life. The next book that we see is the book of remembrance. The book of remembrance that keeps record of every good work that you've done. So this is a, good, this is a book that records all the good deeds that you've done in your lifetime. Okay? The book of remembrance. The next book is the book of record. Now this book has the record of the sins of men. Okay? So... So um, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14 tells us, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So even the secret things that nobody knows about is also recorded on this book of record. And so uh, when we have any sins that remain unconfessed and unrepented of and unforgiven of, the, their names will be blotted out of the book of life and the record of their good deeds will be erased from remembrance. And so that's very serious. That's very serious. But 
As we look at Daniel chapter 7 again, we see as we progress in verse 13, Daniel chapter 7 verse 13, Daniel sees something else happen. In verse 13, he sees a figure. And Daniel 7, 13 says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Okay, so in other words, we see this figure, the Son of Man, coming in the clouds to the Ancient of Days. Okay, reading on, verse 14, And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Okay, so we see that here we see that Jesus is known as the Son of Man, right? How do we know it's Jesus? He's coming in the clouds, right? So obviously we know Jesus also went up in the clouds and the angel said that he'll come in the same manner as he returns the second time. So the question is, in this text, Daniel chapter 7 verse 13, which event is this pointing to? Jesus coming to the clouds to meet the Ancient of Days. What event is this? Okay. I hear some murmuring. I don't hear anything after the resurrection, okay, 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 ministry in the sanctuary is over, okay, well, just before he comes the second time, okay, let's take a look at Great Controversy, page 479, I'm going to read this quote for you, it's up there as well, the coming of Christ here described is not his second coming to the earth, he comes to the Ancient of Days in heaven to receive dominion and glory and a kingdom which will be given to him at the close of his work as a mediator. Now it's very interesting that he's going to receive dominion, glory, and a kingdom at the close of his work as what? Mediator. So in other words, Jesus, when he goes up to heaven, when you ask somebody, what is Jesus doing in heaven now? He's actually mediating for us right now. Okay? Okay. And so it is this coming and not his second advent to the earth that was foretold in prophecy to take place at the termination of the 2300 days in 1844. Attended by heavenly angels, our great high priest enters the Holy of Holies and there appears in the presence of God to engage in the last acts of his ministration in behalf of man, in behalf of us. To perform the work of investigative judgment and to make an atonement for all who are shown to be entitled to his benefits. So we see that G the Ancient of Days, God the Father, who is the Ancient of Days, would give dominion, glory, and his kingdom to his son at the close of his work as high priest. Are you guys following? Okay. So get this. Jesus came to earth. His earthly ministry was to do what? To be the lamb that was slain, right? To take away the sins of the world. After he was slain, he went up to heaven, and he went to the next part of his ministration, which is to be the high priest, right? To take his blood into the heavenly sanctuary, right? And so, <laughs> you may not realize this, but this work that Jesus is doing up in the heavenly sanctuary is a very important work. It's a very important work. It's even just as important as his death on the cross. And we as Adventists know this, and praise God that we know this, because a lot of the evangelical churches, they believe it's all done at the cross. It's all finished at the cross. Praise God. But that's not true. If you look at the sanctuary service, if Jesus died and he didn't resurrect and he wasn't able to play the role as the priest to bring that blood into the sanctuary, we still have our sins to deal with. There's still the issue of sin that is not being addressed if we don't address Christ's ministry in the sanctuary. So this is a very, very important teaching because it gives us full closure to the problem of sin. Are you guys following? Okay. So some of you guys may be saying, big deal, who cares? This just doesn't seem important to me anyway. 
We only as Adventists believe so what? Okay, well, I'm going to give you a quote here. Um, Great Controversy, page 488. Listen to this. It says, the subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment, both go together, okay, should be clearly understood by the people of God. Are you guys the people of God? Okay, so we need to really understand this, right? All need a knowledge for themselves of the position of the work of their great high priest. Otherwise, look, listen to this, it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time or to occupy the position with, which God designs them to fill. So in other words, if you don't understand the sanctuary, you don't understand your purpose for being a Seventh-day Adventist. You just think it's just any other denomination that I happen to stumble into or be born into. You don't know your true purpose if you don't understand the sanctuary, Christ's role in the investigative judgment. And if you understand it, it just has so much more meaning and purpose to what your role is in these last days. So Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary involves both the investigative judgment and the atonement. Okay, so in Revelation chapter 4, verse 7, it tells us in the first angel's message to fear God and give glory to him. Why? Because the hour of his, what? Judgment has come. So in other words, my friends, if the three angels' messages is a time for relating to us, addressing us, we are living in the judgment time. Are you guys with me? We're living in this judgment time. Okay? And 2 Corinthians 5.10. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So clearly, how many will be judged? All in this judgment, friends. All will be judged. But my question to you is this. Do you know who's going to be judged first? Who, where is God going to start this judgment? Okay, let's take a look at the Bible. 1 Peter 4, verse 7 and 8. Turn there with me. Who is God going to judge first? 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18. 1 Peter chapter 4, 17 and 18. Who is God going to judge first? And in 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18, if you're there, say amen. It says, for the time has come that judgment must begin where? At the house of God. In other words, who's in the house of God? God's people. Those who claim to be God's people or God's people, both. Okay? And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And it, listen to this. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the godly and the sinner appear? Very serious, solemn words, isn't it? So we see We see in the typical service only those who had come before God with confession and repentance and whose sins through the blood of the sin offering were transferred to the sanctuary had a part in the service of the Day of Atonement. So in the great Day of Atonement and investigative judgment, the only cases considered, listen to this, are those of the professed people of God. The judgment of the wicked is a distinct and separate work and takes place at a later period. So in other words, judgment begins with God's people. Anyone that claims to be God's people, they're going to investigate to see whether or not that's true. And so, you know, it's interesting. You know, the stories that Jesus told, right? Jesus told a lot of stories. As I started to think about it when I was preparing this message, I saw that a lot of these stories shared one common thing. Like, for example, the story of the wheat and the tares. Let both grow till the harvest, and then pull up the tares and the wheat together and cast the tares, tie them in bundles and cast them into the fire, right? So in other words, in order for them to recognize between wheat and tear, there had to be an investigation. Are you following? 
Okay? The story of the sheep and the goats, right? Sheep were on the right side, goats were on the left side. There had to be an investigation. Right? Faithful and the wicked servant, there had to be an investigation. The fig tree that wasn't bearing fruit, there had to be an investigation. The wedding garment at the wedding feast, an investigation. The talents, investigation. So in other words, this investigative judgment is for those who profess to be Christians to see if they are truly living up to the Christian life. So in other words, the investigative judgment is to see who is really God's people. Now, <laughs> I know that we keep saying God is love, right? And, and, and people are probably telling me, you know, Pastor, God is love. Stop talking about all this judgment stuff. You know, just talk, focus on his love. Well, my friends... <laughs> You know, this topic is important because the judgment actually shows us that God is a God of love. And you, you may be thinking, like, how? I don't see it. Right? But, but listen to this. God loves the sinner so much that he is faced with a dilemma. Okay, listen to me. He loves the sinner so much that he's faced with a dilemma. How can he take the sinner that he loves and separate sin from the sinner? Because sin has to be destroyed. But the sinner has sin. And how can he remove the sin from the sinner? That's the problem that God has, is faced with. And he loves each and every one of us as sinners. He loves sinners, but he hates the sin. He will not save us in our sins, but he will save us from our sins. And that is what the whole purpose of the sanctuary service is about. In Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, it says, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The cleansing of our sins can only be done through the sanctuary service. And we see, what does the sanctuary need to be cleansed from? <laughs> you know, whenever you uh, ask for forgiveness for a sin, what takes place? When you say, Lord, forgive me for doing this. I repent of my sins and I turn away from my sins. Forgive me. What takes place the moment you pray that prayer? Okay? I, I want to hear some confidence. Okay? Well, what happens when you, when you pray a prayer and God forgives you of your sins? What happens to your sin? Okay, it doesn't disappear, okay? I heard someone say it disappeared. It doesn't disappear. Do you know what happens to your sin? It's covered with the blood of Jesus, but the record of that sin still remains. It still remains. And it's stored in the heavenly sanctuary. So when it's saying that unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, what it's talking about is that finally there will come a point where the sanctuary that is housing, it's like a chamber that's holding all the sins of mankind, will finally be no more. Erased to oblivion. Now, how does that sound? Would you like your sin to be no more forgotten, not even a record of? That's why the sanctuary teaching is so important. Because it tells us what Jesus is going to do with our sins. How he's going to get rid of our sins. But right now, every sin that I have committed is now recorded up in heaven. Although I am forgiven and Jesus' blood covers me from that sin, that record is still up there. Until end of what we know as the anti-typical day of atonement. Once this day of atonement is over, that's when sin is completely done away with. And we're going to talk about that. But listen to this. By the virtue of the atoning blood of Christ, the sins of all the truly penitent will be blotted from the books of heaven. Thus the sanctuary will be freed or cleansed from the record of sin. In the type, this great work of atonement or blotting out of sins was represented by the services of the day of atonement. The cleansing of the earthly sanctuary, which was accomplished by the removal 
by virtue of the blood of the sin offering, of the sins by which it had been polluted. So in other words, the earthly sanctuary shows us what takes place with our sins, right? So for example, daily sacrifice, the sinner puts his hand over the lamb, right? Slits the throat of that lamb, the blood comes out, the lamb dies, they, the priest takes that blood and goes into the sanctuary and sprinkles that blood on the veil, right? But when it comes to the Day of Atonement, it's different. Okay, and we're going to talk about how it's different and how that's relevant. So the, the anti-typical Day of Atonement, instead of the sinner placing his hands over the lamb, they have two goats, right? And so they cast lots for the goat, one for the Lord, one for Azaziel, right? And so what they do is they gather, they kill the, 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 the goat for the Lord. They don't confess the sins on it, okay? That's the difference. They kill it because that represents Christ. And the blood that that lamb spills represents the pure blood of Christ without sin in it, right? And so when the priest goes in there and he administers that blood, that blood is the pure blood of Christ that blots out all record of sin from that previous year, right? And then the priest comes out and the priest that now lays hands on the other goat and transfers all the sins of the camp to that goat. And then takes that goat, with a strong fit man takes that goat and takes it to the wilderness where it's left there. That represents Satan. When he's going to be also left in a desolate place for a thousand years. And we're going to, be, we're going to revisit this in a second. But, but we see that right now we are living in the anti-typical Day of Atonement, friends. And here's what, it's, uh, and, and here's what it is right here. Three phases of judgment, okay? 1844 is what we saw in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, we see that Jesus comes to the Ancient of Days, 1844. That's where he starts his ministry in the most holy place. Okay? And this is the last work that he must be involved in before his second coming, where he now gets a dominion and a kingdom and power. Okay? So before that takes place, we are living in this first phase of judgment. This is called a pre-advent judgment or the investigative judgment. And who are judged in this phase? God's people, right? After God comes and takes his people home, we are there for a thousand years, and now who are being judged? Satan, his angels, the wicked, and God. Now, I'm saying God in a very respectful way because I'm not saying that God is guilty of anything. But there's going to be questions that people will have when they get to heaven. Why isn't my, my cousin here? Why isn't my mother here? Why isn't so-and-so here? And God's going to open the books and reveal everything. So then we will be acknowledging that God was right. God was just in his judgment. Right? So God will be vindicated there. And then after that, after the thousand years come, then the end of the millennium, and we see that the wicked are finally judged with their ultimate ultimate um, destruction. Okay? So, that's what it is in a nutshell. Now, let's read this quote. We are now living in the great day of atonement. In the typical service, while the high priest was making the atonement for Israel, all were required to afflict their souls by repentance of sin and humiliation from the Lord. So in other words, as the priest was actually administering this in the most holy place, everybody outside was not partying. They were not having a good time. They were not like having a leisurely activity and just waiting, oh, I wonder when that priest is going to come out so we can start getting around to our business. No, they weren't doing that stuff. Okay? As they were, as the priest was working, all were required to what? Afflict their souls by repentance of sin and humiliation before the Lord. See, in other words, it was a very serious time. They needed to pray and afflict their souls. They needed to search their hearts to make sure, did I confess every sin? 
because if they neglected to confess a sin, they would be cut off from the camp. Because this was a time where the sin would be completely erased, but if any sin remains, they would be cut off from the camp. So the people during this time, it was a time of trembling. It was a time of like soul searching. It was a time of, it was a very serious time. Saying, am I right with God? Did I, did I confess everything? Am I, did I turn away from all my sins? Right? And in like manner, all who have their names retained in the book of life should now, in the few remaining days of their probation, afflict their souls before God by the sorrow for sin and true repentance. There must be a deep, faithful searching of the heart. The light, frivolous spirit indulged by so many professed Christians must be put away. Today we kind of have a false sense of security in where we think we are. And we just indulge in the world and we think everything's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. There's an earnest warfare before all who would subdue the evil tendencies that strive for the mastery. The work of preparation is an individual work. We are not saved in groups. The purity of the, and devotion of one will not offset the want of these qualities in another. Though all nations are to pass in judgment before God, yet he will examine the case of each individual with as close and searching scrutiny as if there were not another being upon the earth. Everyone must be tested and found without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. However, we as a church, we as individuals, there exists a sad state of ignorance. Of the deceit that lurks within the human heart, which constantly inclines to self-indulgence, pride, and love of self-exaltation. And seeking the praise of men. Souls are lulled, souls are lulled to sleep in the cradle of cardinal security. 1 John 1, 8 says that if we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If you claim you're not a sinner, and you claim you have no sins, you're putting yourself at great risk, my friends, because you may not be a drug dealer, you may not be a prostitute or alcoholic, but pride, selfishness, covetousness, the hidden cherished sins harbored in the heart are more offensive to God. Because those things, pride, shuts us off from God because it makes us feel like we don't need God. I'm fine just the way I am. And my friends, that is very characteristic of the Laodicean condition. We are the church of Laodicea. We have that same condition where we say, I am rich and increased with goods. I have need of nothing, but we are miserable, blind, naked. You know, sin must be blotted out by the great day, on the great day of atonement so that we can be part of the first resurrection. But do we really, do we really understand the concept of what sin really is? What is sin? I like what John Wesley, the reformer, his mother, Susanna Wesley, wrote to him, and she told him this is what sin is. Her definition of sin, listen to this. She says, Take this rule. She's talking about this is what sin is. She says, whatever weakens your reason, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, or takes off your relish of spiritual things, in short, whatever increases the strength and the authority of your body over your mind, that thing is sin to you. However innocent it may be in itself. When I read that quote, I thought, wow, is this Ellen White speaking? <laughs> it kind of sounded like one of her quotes, but it was Susanna Wesley, Methodist. 1 John 2, 1 says, My little children, these things I write to you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So in other words, my friends, you may be despairing, saying, oh, I sin. Like, what am I going to do? I can't remember every sin that I co uh, confessed. And will God hold me accountable? We see that we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And that's good news, my friends, because the judgment shows us that we are not alone in this judgment. 
Jesus is there to ensure that we pass through the judgment into eternal life, to be with him forever. Jesus is doing all that he can to ensure a place for us in heaven. He says, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am ye may be also. And how is he preparing that place? Not building a mansion in heaven. No. He's preparing a place by doing the work in the sanctuary so that your justification can be secured. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not just some. Not just 95%. All. You know, it's interesting. Um, in the Bible, they represent lepers. Like when Jesus healed a leper. You guys remember that story? In the Bible, leper, leprosy was kind of described as like a, like a symbol of sin. And, you know, when, when these lepers would walk around, what did they have to cry out? So people would stay away. Unclean, unclean, right? Well, we see that this one leper was going about his business, but then one day he sees Jesus. He hears that Jesus is in town. And hope is stirred in his heart, and he seeks to find Jesus, and he's walking. He sees Jesus from a distance, gathered around with all these people, and he starts to make his way towards Jesus, not being aware of the fact that he needs to cry out, unclean, unclean. He wants to just have this chance to have Jesus heal him, irregardless of what other people say. And as he's going there, I'm sure some people are screaming at him, get away, a leper, and they're throwing rocks at him to try to deter him from coming, but he keeps coming. And he finally approaches Jesus, and he says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus, his response is so beautiful. Is that I could picture the tenderness in his voice, and he says, I am willing. And he touches him, be cleansed. Now, the interesting thing is, we just dismissed the story right there. But do you know what Jesus told the leper to do? He told that leper to now go show yourself to the priest to confirm that he was cleansed. I think there's some sort of lesson in that for us because who's our high priest that examines our hearts and our condition? And Jesus is ministering in the heavenly sanctuary right now and he's examining our hearts. He's examining us to see if he can give us the declaration that we are from sin. And is that possible? Is it possible to be cleansed from sin? Is it possible for us to not sin? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I believe that Jesus is stronger than the devil. What do you say? The power in the blood of Jesus can remove us from all sins. You know, it's interesting in the context of Daniel chapter 7, we see a judgment scene mentioned every time the little horn is mentioned. Okay? The little horn, he's persecuting God's people. Little horn saying great and mighty things against the Most High. The little horn is changing times and laws. And, he's, and we see the judgment scene every time afterwards. But you know what's interesting? The little horn is based is Satan's instrument or agent to attack the saints. And, and we can use this example from Revelation 12 where the great dragon, right, was actually trying to attack the baby Jesus and kill him. But was it really the devil literally trying to kill Jesus or was, was the devil using an instrument like King Herod to do it, right? And so the little horn, get this, Revelation 12:10 says, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren who was accusing them before our God day and night has been cast down. And Daniel 7.25 shows that the little horn attacking God's people. And Revelation 12.10 10 shows that the dragon is attacking God's people. And notice the role that Satan plays. He is the accuser of God's people. And so when Jesus is pleading 
for the subjects of his grace. Satan accuses them before God as transgressors. The great deceiver has sought to lead them into skepticism, to cause them to lose confidence in God, to separate themselves from his love, and to break his law. So Satan will do anything he can to push us to the, to the limit, to, to compromise our loyalty to God by breaking his commandments. Now he points the record of their lives to the defects of character, the unlikeness to Christ, which has dishonored their Redeemer to all the sins that he has attempted, that he has tempted them to commit. And because of this, he claims them as his subjects. So Satan is accusing us. He's actually saying, look at what they did. Look at what they did. They're not yours. They're mine. They did all this stuff. They're more like mine. They're on my side. They're not yours. And how does Jesus, how does Jesus fight Satan on that? It says, Jesus does not excuse their sins, but he shows their penitence and faith and claiming for them forgiveness. He lifts up his wounded hands before the Father and the holy angels saying, I know them by name. I have grafted them in the palm of my hands. The sacrifices of God is of a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, thou wilt not despise. And the accuser of the brethren, Jesus will say, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. For this one has been plucked as a brand out of the fire. And their names stand enrolled in the book of life. You know, Jesus has done everything that he possibly can to ensure our salvation. However, however, are we cooperating with what he has made available to us in confessing our sins, having that truly repentant heart having that hatred for sin, having that love for God that is unshakable, that even you would be willing to face death rather than disobey God. Because when this investigative judgment, which has begun in 1844, we know the starting point where it began, 1844, but we don't know when it's going to end. But we have an idea. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Turn there with me. When will this judgment supposedly end? Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. It says, I hear pages rustling. If you're there, say amen. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 tells us, And at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So my friends, whenever there's a standing up, right, it's signaling that the judgment is over. When a judge stands up after the courtroom, after the court session is over, he stands up. When Jesus stands up, Michael stands up, court, the investigative judgment is over. And that's where we read that every person's destiny is sealed. Revelation 22, verse 11 tells us, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let it be holy still. We see the ultimate declaration has been decided based on our choice. You see, my friends, God has given us a great gift, the gift of choice. He allows us to choose our own way or his way. He will never force it upon us. And yes, the judgment is scary, but could it be that we are scared of the judgment because we ourselves know that we are not right with God? Because if we know that we are right with God, would there be fear? Because perfect love casts out all fear, right? And if we love him, we will keep his commandments. Because Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And this is the typical description of God's people in the last days. Those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now that's very important that you put those two together. Keep the commandments of God. 
by the faith of Jesus. Right? When Jesus was here on this earth, he had complete implicit faith on his heavenly Father, which enabled him, through that connection, to do the impossible. That's how Jesus was able to live in this earth without sin. That's how we can also live above our sinful natures if we are connected to the divine nature. And it says that when Michael stands up, Jesus changes his garbs of priestly robes. And he puts on the garbs of a conquering king as he comes to claim his kingdom, dominion, and his people. When that happens, when that happens, God's people will have a temporary time where they have to stand without a mediator. That means Christ will no longer be administering for our sins. We have to be able to stand on our own for that brief period of time until Jesus comes. And that's going to be the time of trouble where everyone, Satan's going to muster everyone to force and to coerce and to cause people under pressure to break God's commandments. And everything around them is going to make it seem like that God has forsaken them. But God's true people will stand firm and say, Lord, I don't know if you're coming. I don't know if you're there. But just like Jacob, they're wrestling with God and saying, I will not let you go. Even though all these things are happening to me, I will not let you go, Lord. I'm going to hold on to your promises, even though I don't see the promises in the dark cir circumstances around me. We need to learn to cultivate that faith. And that starts with us learning how to have victory over our sinful nature through the help of God. You know, it's interesting. Whenever my wife and I invite someone to our house, we are in a mad rush to get things cleaned up. <laughs> We're like, make sure everything's cleaned up, put everything away, they're coming. And we, and, and it's, it's quite comical if you actually think about it, if you're there. I'm sure the angels are watching us like laughing, like, <laughs> these guys. <laughs> and why are we cleaning up? Why couldn't we just have our place all in a disarray and say, hey, come into our house. This is, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, this is it. Oh, you could move that stuff out of the couch and sit there. Well, why don't we do that? <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting. We know, we know that when someone's going to come to our house, they're going to, in a way, investigate our house and kind of say, oh, so they're, 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 they're that kind of people. <laughs> I said too much. Okay, but, but, but the point is, Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart. He wants to come in. And your heart inside is a mess. And you're saying, oh, Lord Jesus, I don't want you to come in. No, not now. No, I am, I am not ready for you to come right now. Let me just get rid of my stuff first. I'll get around to it eventually, but not now. I'm very busy right now, Jesus. And Jesus is saying, let me help you. Let me come in. Don't hide it from me. Because I'm here to help you address those problems. I'm, help, I'm here to help you address those sins in your life, those cherished sins that you have in your closet, those things that you have on your computer, I'm here to help you get rid of those things. And you know what? Christ's presence, when we allow Christ into our presence, he ha his very presence banishes those things. His very presence condemns sin. And so why wouldn't we want to answer the call when he's knocking on the door of our hearts? And you know, we are the last day church, Laodicea. And it says that I am knocking. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any, if any man open the door and let me in, I will come in with him and sup with him. And I believe that when it means sup with him, I believe that he's going to break down God's word so that it becomes digestible to us and integrated as part of us. 
So no matter who you are, no matter what your life has been, you can be saved only in God's appointed way. We must repent. We must fall helplessly on the rock, Christ Jesus. You must feel your need for a physician, just like that leper did. And the only remedy for sin is the blood of Christ. And this remedy can only be secured by our repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Here, the work is yet to be begun by many professed Christians, even ministers of Christ. So I want to ask you, do you want to make that commitment today? Remember, don't, don't say, oh, I'm okay. Because <laughs> when you say that, that shows you're not okay. We all need Christ. Because when you're saying, I'm okay, what you're act actually saying is, I don't need Christ. I don't need him to come to me to my heart, not now. But would you like to make that decision now? And say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. There's stuff in my heart that I'm ashamed of, but I know that you're not going to judge me for it, but you're going to help me. Can you help me? If that is your desire, I want you to invite you to stand with me. Make that commitment towards repentance. Make that commitment for true turning away from sin. And asking the Lord to help us every step of the way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have helped us to understand your work in the heavenly sanctuary. And Lord, we love you so much because you love us so much to go through that for this long, to this point, and you're still there, ministry on our behalf. Lord, forgive us for being so callous, forgive us for being apathetic about what you've been doing for us all this time. Lord, we appreciate what you're doing for us. We love you, and we thank you, and we want to follow you. So please, Lord, take our hearts. Come in to our hearts and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Help us to hate the things you hate and to love the things you love. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close with our closing hymn, hymn number 416.